Okay, so uh, evening everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, kind of combined um, race briefing Q&A um, uh, for the race, The Rock, uh, which is taking place this weekend on September the 4th and 5th um, for the two races that have been moved together. Um, I'm Andy Hamilton. I'm one of the senior coaches for Total Tri Training, who are the race partners, official race partners for The Rock series and with the Sensation Group. Um, we've got a panel of experts here, which I'll let them introduce themselves in a, in a few moments. But the plan really is tonight not to be a formal briefing like we've already posted that John and, and Dave and the team have already done or the race recce briefings that have already been posted to the Rock website and via social media. This is very much around an interactive session where um, the athletes who have watched, seen the race briefing, read the race notes um, and are going into the race weekend that might have some questions that um, they want answering or really kind of be able to add some more meat onto the bones of the skeleton that's already been presented out there onto the web. Um, my job is very much to try and MC this and try and uh, get the questions in. So um, when you've got a question, you can either use the chat facility on the Zoom call um, and I will try and read them out. I've already got some questions that have been sent through to me via email, which I'll, which I'll use should um, we run out of questions. Um, hopefully, we're going to try and keep this nice and tight, um, where we've got uh, around 60 minutes. Um, but if the conversation is really good, it's really flowing, we'll let it run over. But also, if we get to a natural point where we think um, we can close the call uh, earlier than that, then we, then we will do. So um, on behalf of myself, Total Try, uh, welcome to this call. Um, I, as I said, I am very much the um, controller of the buttons rather than the one who's going to be doing the talking, which is a first for any of you that know me because I, I love the sound of my own voice. But um, so I'm just going to introduce the, the team that are here to assist and, 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 um, and answer. Um, so in no particular order, we've got Claire Hollyman. Claire Hollyman is one of a long-standing coach within TTT. She is um, one of our kind of crazier adventure racer type coaches as well, who is racing the rock and has provided some of the, um, the recce videos as well. We've got um, Arthur and Catherine Connell, the awesome, the awesome um, combination. Um, Catherine obviously is a previous winner of the race um, and is hopefully going to be able to give us some insights into the course itself from having raced and won it and been at the front of the course. Um, Arthur is a fantastic coach based in, the, in North Wales as well, who is going to help us with some of the coaching and has also provided loads of recce videos, knows that area of the, of the race exceptionally well. We've got John Barrett based in the Isle of Man, is one of our um, great coaches. He's obviously done the race briefing. He's the expert when it comes to transition, registration and stuff. So uh, we'll look to him as well as Dave Murray, who's based up in Scotland, who has also um, helped with the race briefing and is going to help us um, with that kind of uh, the side of the call. We've also got the legend that is Sam Shepherd um, from Total Endurance Nutrition, who are, he's also uh, one of our coaches. He's, he's also a, a brilliant nutritionist and he's going to answer a load of questions. He's also a very, very fast athlete as well. So he's going to be on point to answer any nutrition questions in either the lead up during or post race um, that we, that we might get during this call. Um, I think that's it, guys. I'll let you. I'll let you say hello. I think. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hello. Cool. Good evening. Hey. Okay. So I think without further ado, um, I will open the, the call really to questions. So for those of you that are on the call, feel free to come off mute. You don't necessarily need to be on video, but if you can come off mute, um, and hopefully we will be able to to answer any of the questions that you may have. Or if not, we can go to some of the questions that we've got sent through. Go on, I'll go first. Yeah. No laughing at the back. <laughs> hey, Simon. This is my first significant distance try. Um, I did 255 down in Goodwood a couple of weeks ago, but I only did a third of it as a relay. And I cannot make my mind up to go full aero or stick um take the tri bars off and just go in a road helmet any insight would be i've got a full aero setup uh, road bike tri bars aero helmet etc but i can't decide over to you how much you who do you want uh, to no, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna sit back and defer to you mr connell okay i think it's a great question and i think that you can get lots of different perspective 
personally, I'd say it's not hilly enough to use the road bike, and I would go full aero. The climbs aren't long enough. Uh, you can get enough speed to go up and over them. That's just my opinion, but I think it's useful to get opinions of the others. So yeah, I think there's quite a lot of fast, flat sort of sections as well, and there can be a headwind. So I think the more aero you can get, the better. <laughs> and ultimately, it's it, it, it depends. That great get out of jail free line. It's whatever you think you're going to be most comfortable uh, doing. If you want to wear your aero helmet, great. If you'd rather have a bit more ventilation, depending on what the uh, the weather conditions are going to be, or you can go for a combination. But um, yeah, only you will truly know. Sorry about that vague answer. I think that another thing to consider is not just the aerodynamics. I think it's the fact that this is a very different event to what you may have been used to unless you've done this event before. So um, because you've gone up and down the mountain, you then have to go back into aero position if you are on a time trial bike, especially if it's got an aggressive setup. And this could put quite a lot of strain on your hamstrings and it might cause you to cramp. So... It all depends on how comfortable you are on your time trial bike under that kind of pressure for a prolonged period of time. You know, so if you're on a road bike, at least you can have that sort of comfortable upright position and keep the cramp at bay. If that's up to you. Sorry. That's uh, food for thought there. Um, I, I think it'll be road bike and tri bars and I'll decide on the helmet on the day. <laughs> So uh, I, I'm probably going to jump in at that point because I think that's probably a nice segue to one of the questions that we were sent through, um, which was around on the bike course, it, um, are any of the hills very steep or are, it, are there any technical descents that mean I need to be cautious or worried? So I think that's probably a good question in combination of the aero because you know some people aren't necessarily as confident riding deeper section wheels or the braking isn't as good. So um I'm going to put that question to you guys that know the course, you know, does the course in terms of ascending or descending dictate whether for some people it might be beneficial to go a slightly more robust, steady, sorry, sturdy setup compared to maybe a full aero? Um, I think just from my experience that um, when you're heading from Abersock over to Cricketh, um, it's big, wide, open roads. You're on a main A road. Um, so you, you can get, you can get crosswinds so just to be aware, aware of that if you're like running a disc or deep rim wheels but if you feel otherwise comfortable I would go aero um, the course the bike course isn't that technical um, um, even when you get towards the towards uh, t2 so um, I feel that personally for me um, my standard TT bike setup which is not that advanced um, was fine and I didn't really have any issues. Anybody else want to? Um, sorry, I don't know what to, um, Anybody else want to add to, to that? I think I'd go with my TT bike. When I rode it the other week, I rode out from the Watkins Path and then back to the Watkins Path. Um, the only bit where I found I was a little bit kind of like came up off my bars was wiggling down through the forest mm -hmm. after Bed Gallet. Um, it can get quite busy with traffic and there's cars trying to overtake so I found that I was like off my bars there and I was just like take it easy and there's a sharp there's a turning at the bottom as well where people come out of so I was just pretty careful through there and then again going into Beg Gellet where you turn into the village that was the only other little bit where I was just like oh yeah take care slow down so it was quite busy but I was yeah mid mid morning holiday traffic as well. Yeah, actually, I did find that last time I was racing that it was very busy and you have to watch out for cars suddenly pulling out of laybys in Cricketh and also just before you approach T2 where people commonly park to go up Snowden Path. Often they don't appreciate that there's a bike race on. So they just think, they just see a load of bikes and think I'm going to pull out straight ahead of that, that person because they don't realise how fast you're going. So, yeah, it's really important to um, just slow down and, and take it to care. Yeah, just, just assume people don't know there's a race on. Yeah. Um, and so take it upon yourself to 
do all the uh, avoiding manoeuvres that you can. Um, probably that goes from the bike and on the hill as well. I, I've been reading stones. Pretty busy. So if somebody doesn't get out of your way, don't take it personally. They're probably not aware that there's uh, several several athletes on the map. Yeah, I agree. Um, the thing I'd probably add to that is I think the forecast for the weekend is pretty good um, from what I've seen. And that probably means that there will probably be some people wanting to be going up Snowden earlier, which may be a little increase in traffic on that those sections. So assume assume everyone's an idiot on the, in the cars and they you know always give them a wide berth i think it's very easy especially coming back to the aero question you know we can have our heads down racing but as the team have said i think there are sections where having your wits about you and even coming up for those few those few you know turnings or whatever is is way beneficial than than ending your race because someone decided to to pull out on you um yeah. during the courses yeah. Sorry, just, just to add to it uh, on the Itcharka, we do have, uh, I'm every weekend in Bad Galert and I'm passing Watkin Pass every weekend. Uh, yes, uh, if you will be closer to lunchtime, going probably back from Snowdon, uh, the last weekend, the Watkin Pass car park, where you will be turning, I think, left and then right on main road, is rampacked. Yeah. And uh, ritual idiots, the, the walkers don't look at the road. So, and in Bad Gallard Center, there is ice cream shop you'll be passing. The people and the kids, if they're still with bed, they will not look that you are, you know, ramping it, you know, at high speed. So just be really careful there. Thanks, Zaka. Yeah. Really that reminds me, actually, that did happen to me on the way through Bed Gallet, on the way back up to Snowden, because I'd done it in reverse. And literally a whole family just yeah. straight out in front of me in the middle of the road. I was just like, uh, yeah, it just didn't look. So, yeah, be super careful. The easiest, the easiest option there is to steal their ice creams as you fly yeah. past them. That, that, that would be Arthur's, <laughs> Arthur's job, that. Um, yeah. I, I, think, I think overall, I think there is, you know, in any race, the matter of the condition, especially when there's a tourist attraction is, I think, you know, fundamentally, we want everybody to have a safe race. Yeah. Um, and, and to have a great experience. And if you accept that there's going to be a bit of traffic and there's going to be busy sections, you can still have an amazing day, you know. Um, and I think the reality is, is it's probably a small percentage that are going to, that would want to do anything to upset the race. So um, I think that's, that's worth saying. So, um, okay. So is there anybody else that's got another question? Um, open back up to the floor. Yeah, I've got a question just, just on the run more than anything. Um, and in fact, is, 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 Arthur providing everyone with bananas for the weekend. I've just seen his stash behind him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, how many is it that you need to eat to get? Is it radioactive poison? <laughs> <laughs> Not as many as I've eaten. <laughs> so, so on on the run. Uh, I mean, the run's going to be my worst discipline. Is is it going to be basically a walk to the top? Um, and how technical, or sorry, how exposed, it, I mean, I hate exposed things. Um, Striding Edge, hate it with a passion. So I'm just wondering, A, how exposed it is, and B, is it just going to be a slow plod up to save something for the, for the ride back? And Mark, just, ju just before Arthur, you jump in there, um, that actually lends itself really nicely to one of the questions that had come through, which was, um, I'm worried because in training, I've not been able to run all the way up small hills off the bike so I have no chance of running all the way up Snowden was one of the questions so I think Arthur if you want to I know, I know you were keen to answer that so probably a perfect question for you I think uh thanks Hamo yeah and great question Mark like so I think one of the problems can be that in your mind you you get off on wherever you are in the race unless you're leading the race you you think to yourself that those in front of you are bounding up the mountain like elegant gazelles and believe me they're not you know people struggle up and so it's it's not a case of if you have to walk that you're in the mindset that you've given up it, it's a case of there's a lot of variable gradient if there's places where you can't walk it's likely that taking longer faster strides walk places where you can't run sorry power walking is is a viable option but you mustn't enter into that mentality in your head that you are then going to walk the whole thing. So set yourself little targets like, can I run for 30 seconds? Can I power walk for 30 seconds? If you can't, can you run for 15 seconds? Can you power walk for 
15 seconds. And in some ways, it, it helps to lock on to somebody else and just use them as somebody to, to beat, if you like. It, you're working off each other, you know, to just get up the mountain faster. So just because you can't run, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get up the mountain quicker. Uh, and, you know, you, you'll push yourself a lot harder if you've got like that positive, this is okay kind of attitude. You won't be able to run up the scree slope. Nobody can. Uh, that's at the end. You, it's more of a sort of semi scramble. Um, but yeah, an awful lot of people can't run the whole thing. So it's a case of run when you can and don't feel that you've failed just because you've started to walk. Because I mean, I'm going to be walking and sitting down when I can, you know. <laughs> well, I see you stopping down. up with the pools yeah. on the way up, you know. To have a yeah, yeah. Up, yeah. Um, yeah, fine. And, and, and uh, so ex exposure wise, because like I said, I don't really like exposed areas. Um, Snowden's probably the wrong place. So when we did the training weekend last weekend, uh, sorry, last weekend, last year, uh, we went on the back from Clamberis and it wasn't exposed at all. I'm just wondering how, because I didn't get a chance to wreck the walking path. So is it is it dodgy? Is it not? Um, I, I'd say that you might agree with me, Arthur. The lower section's really lovely because you're kind of going up through a valley and it feels very, very safe. And then you start to climb and it gets steeper. And when you hit that ridge line is almost when, if the weather's a bit worse higher up, that's when you start to feel it and you'll notice the temperature change and the wind gets up. So it's not awful, but the scree section, it is use your hands, you know, it is take care. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if the weather is poor up there, if something does happen at the weekend, they will, I imagine, bring the level that you turn around lower. They wouldn't put us at risk. I think it looked like, like Hannah said, it look, I think it looks pretty good, the weather, doesn't it? So it's it should be pretty settled. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, I can... the, only, the only thing I would, you know, again, it's not the line but particularly well-rounded um uh mounting yeah. going, but the conditions the conditions can change and that's one of the reasons why the race brings with it these amazing challenges of going up and i think you know is what could be reasonably nice weather at at kind of lake level or or, or watkins path start level could be very different by the time you get an hour and 20 minutes up up, up the climb so um i'd probably just throw throw that in and something i'm not Again, that's what that's why we take stuff with us. So, um, but I, I think the marshals and the safety team on the course will always adjust as required, dependent on the conditions. And I, I know this is a daft question to, to, to ask, but for, for an average, I mean, average ish runner, how long do you think it'll take up and down? Two hours, three hours? I did, I did it in two hours 34 last year, and I'm a fat old bloke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um, so uh mark just to pick that up and uh it was a question actually from steve as well earlier on before we, we we started the call about what's the average time so um i don't know if um claire do you want to pick that up um, well i was looking at the results and um you can get people going up in under an hour and coming down really super quick but you need to i mean there was quite a few people going up up in two hours and it depends on your skills as well coming down the mountain. Yeah, I was just about to, to add in, we, we're, we're, we're thinking about going up the mountain and that we might not be going as quick or, you know, we're losing time to our, our goal for the day. But when you turn around and come back down, just always remember to try and run within your limits. You know, don't, you know, throw caution to the wind and start, you know, screaming down the mountain uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there's still lots of people on the course. Um, you might, you know, have a little trip or an accident, but then not forget that you do have to cycle 50k back uh, and then have a little jog on the beach. So, you know, just be, be mindful about, you know, the, your, the pace or the speed with which you would normally descend on, on certain types of terrain. Cool. No, thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Cheers, Mark. Hey, Mark just, just for you, um, because you are quite fast anyway. On hills. The upper part, if there are hikers, it's quite difficult to overtake. And maybe Katrin can confirm that because it's quite narrow pass. So that is, you know, impossible sprinting down on the upper part. 
you said you were giving me a piggyback anyway, Sarka. <laughs> on Sunday, unless you are doing double. Oh, Sunday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, I'm doing double. Lots of runs all day. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, okay, so I'm just going to take, because there's some questions coming in on the chat as well, so I just want to, before we go back to the, to the group as well, a um, couple of quick ones. Is the king and queen of cr Crickieth sprint challenge clearly marked? Anybody know that? Or is it just you've got to know where the start and end is? Mm. Oh, that's a good point I, I don't remember it being there on 2019 no, so this thing. might be a new thing yeah. uh, maybe so I'm not sure. yeah. okay well I'll, I'll try and find the answer for that um here's going and um, from Catherine would you recommend using a gpx for a bike nav or is the, is the route clearly signposted um I think I it was well signposted I don't um I didn't think I had any issues with getting lost but it, I think it is worth looking at the route before before you start, so you know roughly where you're going. Um, it, it is generally an out and back in sort of one direction, and then you turn around and come back. Um, so it's not really tricky. Um, I think it's difficult to get lost, but just maybe have a little look at the route beforehand. I Yeah, I would probably add to that from a, from a race organizer's perspective of years of experience is always know the route before you start the race, whether it's the bike course or the run course. It's, it's not a marshal's job to tell you which way to go. Because if they t accidentally told you the wrong way, you could ruin your day. So having an idea of the course is always advantageous. I think if you've got a bike computer that can take a, can take a course on it, it's not going to do you any harm to have it on there should you need it. You know, um, I think that's probably a safety thing. But ultimately, it is pretty well signposted. And dare I say it, unless you're leading the race, there's always someone in front to follow. <laughs> so, and which means if you get lost, you've always got company. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably say that. Um, OK, this one I'm going to pass to Mr. Murray. Um, what's the sea temperature been lately trying to decide between sleeved and sleeveless wetsuit? Hey, guys. Um, yeah, so today it was 17.4, 17.6 is what I've seen. So come from Scotland, positively warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wetsuits, you can make the call on that because um, they're only mandatory under 14 um, degrees. So just going off the, the water temperatures just now, I don't think it's going to drop three degrees um, by the weekend. So, yeah, you can make the call between sleeves and sleeveless or no wetsuit. No, I'm really just good. sorry to interject. Um, day. But one of the things I was in Anglesey a few weeks ago, uh, and there were a boatload of jellyfish. So I don't know what Abbasock's like at the moment. So in that case, I'd probably I got stung on my face and my wrist. So just for that reason, I'd wear a full suit, pure because I don't want to get loads of stings if there are any. Sorry. My my yeah. understanding is I think that the the rock is a mandatory wetsuit regardless. Um, so I think. I think um, from when I looked at the race briefing and, 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 and spoke to the team, I thought they were trying to enforce a mandatory wetsuit um, regardless, I think. And let's be honest, it's not going to get to 24 degrees. So I, I think the assumption is everybody will need to be in a wetsuit. Yeah, I would, I would definitely go with a wetsuit. Um, and yeah, Mark, going on Kelly's West Coast, pretty notorious for jelly so i would yeah just to be on the safe side i would go full sleeves um but it depends how how comfortable you are if you want to go sleeveless um but yeah 17.6 degrees so it's not really anything anything scary to worry about um at all if you ask me yeah no absolutely it adds to the experience of the day i feel um Okay, um, right, we're just going to go um, back to the, 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 the I'm going to go back to the lines callers. Um, anyone on uh, wants to ask a question directly on, on video or, or, or speaker? Um, if not, we'll go to the, the questions that have come up. It's me again. The turn, oh. the turn right, turn round on the mountain. Do we have to go to the top of the trig point? Because I know recently there's been half hour queues to get up there. And it's oh. not wide enough for two. Go on. You, you don't. 
that's not where the turnaround is. It's just before. Uh, it's before you get off the sort of rugged part of the mountain and then onto the sort of cafe platform. So they, they turn around there. It's not quite at the top. So you don't go. Thank you. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, someone else has just has just asked uh, about um, TT versus Road for the Rock England. Um, I'm not sure if anyone. I know we covered that for the Rock uh, Spring and Summer, but I'm not sure the Rock England one. Does anybody know what that route's like? I think the profile's pretty flat. I, I've signed up for that as a Sarka. Um, I, I, it's similar, I think, elevation-wise to Snowden. Right. So it's, yeah. So it's there are, there, there's undulating. more benefits of being, being aero. Um, and I think, I think you know, certainly um, just speaking from a coaching perspective and, and experience of racing aero is it has to be significantly hilly, you know, for you to probably not get the benefit of riding as aero as possible, you know, um, or or there are there are descents that are technical enough for you to want the better handling characteristics of a of a road bike. Um, I think in all the testing we've seen, most people would always benefit from an aero setup. Um, it more comes down to wind conditions as to what section of wheels you might want to run at the front rather than whether to not go aero, you know. Um, that would be my view. Um, right. Um, going back to the calls then. Anybody else want to ask a question? I have a question regarding nutrition. Yeah. Because I always screwed it up. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what would be the... I cannot really eat too much solid food on the bike. So I'll be on the gels. And I cannot eat on a run either. <laughs> Definitely not on the uphill. So, so what would be maybe even the pre-race the day nutrition which will get me through the swim through the bike up to the snowdown and then i can probably eat on the way down right okay so a bit of bad news for you Saki. you're gonna have to try and eat something um on the way up i would suggest on the uh on the run and i think it probably goes back to a point that um arthur and Kat made as well that um, when when Mark actually asked about walk run and you know accept that you're not going to be able to run it all, I take those opportunities when you are walking to try and take on some nutrition as you're going up. I mean, you know, even before that, the the first bike, and I'd say this to everyone, is that the first bike is absolutely critical in terms of fueling. Do not under fuel that and if anything over fuel it um so the the sort of recommended number is 90 grams per hour so you know base that on what how long you think you're going to ride that first 50k um but if you think you can tolerate even more than that and you're already maybe taking on 90 grams in training for example then don't you know you be temp you, you can go beyond that because that will get you through the first part of the run. What I would say is you can't think about each discipline in isolation. I mean, we're not going to eat anything on the swim. You might drink some salt water, but that's up to you. Um, on the bike, you, you've got to think that you're fueling on the bike for your first run, so for your ascent. When you're running the ascent, you're then fueling the descent. And when you're descending, you're still, again, you're going to have to start to take on some nutrition where you can because you've then got to fuel the bike. And then the bike, you, you know, you're basically taking on a little bit of carbs just to get you to the end of the, of the race, really. So think about, think about it in that respect rather than I'm fueling the bike, I'm fueling the ascent, the descent. You, you're always fueling the next leg, if you like, and, and that'll help you prepare properly. I think... You, you sound like you know you you struggle with the solid foods, Sarka. So on the bike, yeah, I cannot swallow it. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, go with yeah, carb drinks and and gels where you can. I would say um, I, if you've been using any of the like really high carb drinks, then yeah, I do perfect. like started. Yeah, they're actually quite tasty. Yeah, like Morton or Beta Fuel or the Zosin yeah. Super Carbs, anything like that because they're really high carb. Supplement that with gels. 
um, and that should see you to you know to start the the run well but then you're also going to have to probably do the same on the ascent okay i don't know again whether you whether you've got a whether you're carrying drinks or just uh, like a camelback or something like that like, yeah. then don't be you know you can also put some morton or super oh, okay. be fueling that as well and just sip on that regularly because you'll be getting plenty of carbs that way um but yeah i think you've, there's no way around it you know the amount of time you, you're exercising for here that you're going to have to to fuel it and i've done a um, a bit of a video i think on the knowledge i think it's on the knowledge section now on the website about what to eat particularly the day before as well um and again this is a, a general point really that don't underestimate how much food you're going to have to eat the day before a race um anyone who's worked with me will know that you basically wake up in the morning and you're just shoveling carbs down your neck for the rest of the day um and it's it's not that pleasant actually <laughs> um and i've learned to embrace it myself um but you do feel quite full but you've got to do that um to make sure that you're well prepared for um before the next day um and a, a couple of quick tips on that i suppose um is stick to white carbs so you, you know you don't want any wholemeal or anything like that white pasta white rice um, cocoa pops don't be going for porridge in the morning you know things that are going to get into your system fast into your muscles and stored ready for the next day and the other thing i'd say is try and as a as a society we eat our biggest meal in the evening now that is completely the wrong thing to do when you're preparing for a race because if you have a huge bowl of pasta in the evening for example then your body just doesn't have time to process that, store it. It'll probably interfere with your sleep. Uh, you know, most of us probably won't sleep that well the night before a race anyway. I know I don't, but, you know, it's going to play havoc with your sleep and you'll you'll get to the start line the next day feeling quite bloated. So actually reverse that. Breakfast, the day before, just go big. Eat as much as you can and the same at lunch and then your evening meal can be a bit, bit smaller. Um and they're just a couple of general tips, I would I would say. But um, yeah, there's I think there's about a ten minute video on the knowledge section just for a little bit more detail as well on that. Um, Sam, so did you say don't have porridge? So I would avoid porridge the day before because that's generally a more like slow release carb, and it will fill you up, and that's great, you know, for normal day to day activities where we're just trying to fuel the day. And, and release energy slowly but what we need to do the day before a race is get it into into the system through our gut into uh, the blood and into the muscles as, as quick as possible really and so I would suggest you know people who like have Weetabix or porridge or muesli the day before uh, sorry normally on a day I'd swap that out and have something like cocoa pops or rice krispies something like that that's just like straight into the system and then it's not filling you up for the rest of the day. You know, when it comes to mid morning, you can then eat again. Um, I'd say fairly comfortably, but you know, you'll still be a little bit full from breakfast. This, but... this just sounds great. This does. <laughs> Let's that ask exactly this guy more questions. What else can we <laughs> <laughs> And that is exactly the attitude. Um, you just got to embrace it and go, right, I've got today where I can eat as much carbohydrate which i would normally you know the white carbs that you tend to avoid normally you just embrace it and go i can eat as many of these as i can today and i know in the morning i'm going to wake up feeling great and ready to race um so yeah just just embrace it and love it really it's a day of eating okay, so it's those you. um it's those low low or lower fiber foods you know yeah. remember, especially on race day because what goes in fiber wise generally comes out so um and it takes longer to digest and it's slower release of the carbohydrates so um, john i'm i'm glad you just took one for the team because it wouldn't be a triathlon talk if at some point we didn't talk about poop <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's that's our number one hobby yeah well, can, I, can i just say um and yeah like somebody asked i went in town did no triathlon one of the years I, I, I won it, somebody asked me afterwards, what did I eat the day before? And I genuinely ate a whole white loaf with Nutella. And, and the woman just laughed in my face. She thought I was just, she thought I was lying, you know, that I'd gone for this sort of super complex stuff. But uh, 
I think I'll go for that again. It sounds good. <laughs> Loaf of bread and Nutella. Love it. Right. Uh, thanks, guys. Sam, there are a few more nutrition questions, so um, so keep keep on your toes. But uh, as always, Sam, um, a great advice, and I think always some some nuggets there. Unfortunately, not chicken. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Um, let's go back to the questions that have come in from the um, on the chat. So let's just. Uh, quick look um okay um is the run near the top well signposted having walked up and got lost um admittedly in fairly bad conditions just not keen to repeat i guess it's a good question i'm not sure i think along the, the scree slope i think it i don't remember it being that well signposted um but i think generally you'll see like a big line of people going up so it, if, if the visibility is okay then it should it should be quite obvious. They do give you a map that you're meant to take up with you just in case the visibility is poor. But then I do wonder whether they will turn you back sooner rather than let you go right to the top if you can't see anything. Yeah. Fingers crossed for a clear day. Um, <laughs> it comes back to that point, doesn't it, around know, know the route, you know, um, but unless, you, unless you're winning, I suppose, that then... Um, <laughs> There'll always be a line of people. But, <laughs> yeah, um, it's probably a good question, actually. I know there's been a question that's coming around the mountain bag that everybody's got to take with them. Um, what it, is that way you would put your map and you would put anything in there in terms of your safety equipment and stuff? So I'll put that to the group, just a reminder for the group what that mountain bag is. Do they, they give you a map, oh. though, don't they? Yeah, they give you the map. Um, are you talking about the bag that you've got to put all your equipment in? Yeah. And I think there's a mandatory kit list that you of things you have to carry, but just bear in mind that you have to squeeze it. Last in 2019, they gave you like an A4 draw, drawstring bag to put your mountain bag in and your trail shoes. So it can be a tight fit. And this is something I quite I struggled with because I had quite a big bag and my kit was quite chunky and I couldn't get my bag into the small A4 drawstring bag when I, when I finish off the mountain. So it is a balance between making sure you've got a mandatory kit list, but not taking too much stuff that you can't actually fit it into this small drawstring bag that you've got to get everything into um, in the transition for it to get transported back to Abasok. Yeah. I can get the bag from 2019 to show if you like. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, to show All right. you <laughs> Carry on. No, uh, uh, and that, the, the, there is a question actually around that as well, which is, when do the mountain back do the mountain bags they're they're back in Abbasok? The question is, assuming we get back to T2, T3 before 2.30 after finishing the race, can we pick up our mountain bags or do we need to wait until they're brought back to Abbasok at 4 pm? Um, they're brought back. Yeah, they're all brought back. Yeah. You just hang it on the peg with everything in it and it's brought back. But it's quite small. It's not that big. So it's like a just a, a drawstring bag. See? So that's the size it's not yeah. big so you have to get your rucksack in there and your shoes and any like drink or uh they do have drinks at the t2 so um and they do have food there as well like it's it's more a thing that if you've got the choice between carrying a running vest with like you know that's much smaller or a small rucksack a small rucksack is always much bigger than a running vest and so when we practiced putting everything into it I found it actually quite easy compared to last year where Catherine's has actually got a bit of a tear in it, I think, from when she uh, kind of rammed everything back, in, back yeah. in. So that's what it is. <laughs> that can just be a bit stressful when you're packing it all for them to take it out. And then, like you say, when you're tired, trying yeah. to Tetris everything in when your brain's not working is, is uh, yeah, tricky. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, any more questions from video or audio? Regarding the water, sorry, you take up because um, on the snowman, uh, I was on the top and lots of the, the athletes, they carried the bag as well, similar, you know, with their water. They actually were thirsty because they didn't carry enough water with them. Uh, is there any rule? how much water I should take up to actually get me through the snow down, up and down, mainly if the weather, you know, it looks, it will be nice. 
I think in the in the in the race instructions, it reiterates a few times that you should carry with you uh, enough uh, food and water that you think should be sufficient to to get up and, and back down. It doesn't state uh, what that is, it, you know, per liter or how many bars it might be. Um, and uh, I'm not I'm not sure. Is, is there a place? Is there a place to top your water up at the top, Arthur? There's an, I think they've got an emergency water supply, um, but I mean, I wouldn't count on it. Yeah. No. Okay. So, so I think. Um, do you want to? Yeah. In the in the race pack, it suggests that there's a there's a emerge like Arthur says it's emergency water uh, stop at four k going up, and then also at the summit. In theory, I probably wouldn't bank on the one at the summit being there. But maybe at the 4k point. Um, I think Sarka just ideally you'd work on about 500 mils per hour okay. as, a, as a minimum. Um, so try and I guess yeah work it out based on that. Um, but it probably goes back to the other question that you asked in some ways that you don't want to get to the bottom of the mountain in any sort of dehydration state. So whilst I answered the last question about taking on enough carbs during the bike, you're also hydrating for the ascent as well yeah. on the bike. So make sure you're drinking plenty. And if, if you, if you over drink almost a little bit on the bike, it's not too much of an issue. So okay. for example, if you normally took on, I don't know, 750 mil bottle per hour when you're cycling, if you even went eight, 900 a litre, I don't think it'd be too much of an issue. Um, and you'd be in a good place from a hydration perspective to start the ascent. Okay, thank you. Okay, good question. Um, well, here's a good, here's a good one. So nice uh, from the from the chat, which is, um, does anyone brackets not serious racers? And I'm sure even serious racers have had this this conversation. Does anyone ever change kit after the run leg for added comfort on the return leg? or wear bike kit after the swim rather than wearing a tri suit. I'm not going to break any records, so thinking of comfort versus time. I'll open that up to any of our coaches. I, I would say that like my TTT tri suit is just as comfortable over time. No, it's, um, I know, <laughs> you know, it, it's true though. I, I mean, I, I've been out in that TTT tri suit and I could swear- TotalTriTraining.com. It's, it's true though i could swear that i'm in bib shorts right it's really comfy the chamois in it is really really good um and so you know if you've got a chance to get one of them i'd say that they are super super comfortable um but you know really good quality tri suit for something like this like you know you're going to be on the bike you know two to two and a half hours a good quality tri suit you, you know it's only beyond that really isn't it that um the a much bigger pad and then you know you wouldn't want to really like if you if you're talking okay post run to come back on the bike then maybe it's an option but certainly you wouldn't want to be in anything other than a tri suit for the run section because it would be uncomfortable being in bib shorts i would say running up and down that would just be yeah, and I just think it's just a question of whether you can get an extra pair of clothes in that small bag that, that they give you to put into T2. You might find that you've not got enough space in that bag for everything. Yeah. And the, the other there's anywhere is, private either to get changed. Yeah. And then, and then on top of that, it's depending on uh, the level of athlete that you are, is five or 10 minutes getting changed going to be... Uh, close to, to the cutoff at the 4K point yeah. for, for 12 o'clock. That, you know, is a consideration to, to think about. I, I, and I, I would probably add to that is, you know, I think and if, if you take out the, the transition bag issue, I think if you were to put bib shorts on and a, and a well-fitting cycle top to cycle in, there's nothing to say you couldn't run up and down in that. Um, you know, it, but the reality is, is if a proper set of bib shorts is going to chafe, <laughs> you know, is what, what, what's the payoff? And um, for me, I, I think a good quality tri suit should, should be, should be plenty. Um, and if you've been riding in it, you've probably got used to it. So uh, I do think there's a payoff, but I think the fundamental issue is 
somewhere to get changed or somewhere to store the kit that you want to get changed into um, is going to be is going to be the deciding factor there. Um, okay. Um, anyone else from the callers? It's me again. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to see your, your, have you put 50p in the meter yet? Oh, it's my <laughs> webcam on you, mate. Um, I listened to the, or I watched the briefing with John and David earlier on today. And they said if you get caught by the train on the way out and you have to wait at the level crossing for, I don't know, five, six, seven minutes, they give you that time back. It, that's what that's what I think I believe it was John that said that on the briefing that so if you get caught by the train in Port Ely, they give you that back time back at the end of the race so say for instance you lose five minutes waiting for the train what happens if you get to the 4k turnaround at 1202 but you've lost five minutes great question Simon I don't know the answer to that <laughs> but, what we, but what we can do is we can uh, we can ask the organising uh, team, the officials. I, and, um, I, I would probably just, I think that there is, and that from a race direction point of view, and I suppose I always have a probably, um, having been involved in race organising for, for many years, is I think there's always going to be a, a, you know, a, a little bit of leeway there. Is if you said, I got caught by the train and, and you hit the cutoff, I think that the, the, the safety team at that point would would make a call if it's a few minutes. I think if it's 20, 30, 40 minutes, then the, the likelihood is, is your delay that you had from the train wasn't the reason why you missed the cutoff. It was a big train. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think from a safety from a safety point of view is, you know, is uh, that that is there, that is there for, for a reason. Um, but I think the chances of you being delayed significantly enough to... Um, not be able to make that cutoff is more a result of probably the bike leg or the sections prior to that than it is about you being delayed. And that's, mm -hmm. that's probably a tough love question, probably a tough love answer. Great, great answer. I would just say that they did say in the race briefing that this race, the race is a race with a mass start. It's not a time trial. So um, in terms of if you are at the front leading the race, you won't get any time back if you get caught by the level crossing because it's whoever crosses the line first wins. That's what it says in the race briefing. So um, that's as far, as far as my understanding is as well. So I, I think it's it, in a way it is a little bit, it's a bit tough if you do get caught by the train um, and it's just something to bear in mind that there is a level crossing um, and they've given you the time that the train's going to enter and um, Patheli. So maybe if you know you're coming up to that time to so maybe, you know, you could maybe go a little bit faster to try and avoid it or, or just slow down because you know you're going to get caught. I don't know. It's a tricky one. Yeah, maybe that's there for a bit of interpretation, but it does say in the race pack, if you get caught, hand your number in or they'll take your number and you okay. will be awarded that yeah. time. And, and just... In just, both directions. Oh, okay. I think if we... I think if we've got any questions that we can't get answered, um, for those that are asking the questions, feel free to, to email the organised info at the wrong number. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know Mark and Emma and the team will, will get back to you because you know they want you to have a good experience. Um, if if we can't find the answer and get that get that before the end of the call, um, okay. I'm conscious of time as well. And I think this has been a brilliant call so far, and I don't want to I don't want to um, sh shut it down uh, too soon. But I, I, I'm conscious of time. But um, what another good question was around: Are collapsible telescopic poles permitted for the summit run? I presume yes, it, they are. Yes, um, if, yes, if you can get them in your bag. If yeah. they fit in your bag. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, let's go back. Um, there's there's a couple of questions actually about which isn't necessarily race specific, but it's it's to do with the logistics of the race. Is to do with spectators. Um, anyone got any tips from experience for the spectators? Um, and is you know it, it does say is it the beach all the way? And seconded for spectators, is there enough parking near the start? Everyone's just nodding. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's, there's lots of parking, um, but you do have to pay for parking in the golf. Um, it's called, I think it's um, Lawn Golf or something like that. There's lots of parking. It can be quite expensive. Um, so you can pay in advance, I think, for the car park. Um, or there's an app you can pay for paper parking. Um, and then the 1K run on the beach is 
1k on the beach so it's kind of like I think 500 meters out and back on the beach to end with so yeah that's a good good place to spectate awesome thanks Kat um right any other questions from the calls from the callers no okay um I'm going to quickly refer to a couple of the questions um that we've had in which is um if it rains not that the forecast has suggested that there, there will be rain but it is a mountain uh, at the end of the day it's, if it rains should i consider different shoes for the run course given it can it could get slippy you should probably be wearing foul type grippy shoes for the run course anyway it's not something that's appropriate for road shoes um i think if it rains, it it's you know I would I would suggest that if you see any of the path any lines off the path where you can take the grass, take the grass anyway. It's always easier to run down the grassy sections than it is to run on the solid ground, and you'll feel better. But if you notice that the steps or the or stones are wet, there isn't any real grip on any shoe that will save you. If you hit it hard, but you will slip. So uh, take extra care and don't do anything that's outside your comfort zone. Um, you know, don't try anything new on slippy rock descending. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Okay, um, thanks for that. Any other questions from the group? I mean, we've got still got 40 on the call, so I think it's been very uh, useful so far. Any other questions? I'm just I think there was a couple of questions directed towards Dave on uh, sort of logistics, uh, signing in and transition type stuff. Came in on, on an email. Um, let me just, yeah. So um, can you confirm the timings for the different registrations for each race? Um, yep, yeah, if you bear with me, I'll just double check what they are again. Um, I'm just going through that email at the moment, checking all the, all the questions that we didn't have answers to. Yeah. Um, so check in for the summer rock is on the Friday. Um, and that's between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. And then the rock spring is on the Saturday, and that's 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and that's the register. And then the transition on race day opens both the same time, 6 o'clock to 7.45 for both days with the race starting at eight o'clock. So five to nine on Friday for the Rock Summer and then 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. for the Rock Spring guys on the Saturday. Um, then just a couple more questions that we've had through regarding <laughs> COVID. Um, I guess I may as well just go over these just now. Um, do athletes need to have a negative COVID test prior to the race? Um, yes. To get the race go ahead, so they had to yeah, agree sure. this with the local council. Um, so you can provide your negative test through the NHS app, um, or if not possible, with a physical lateral flow test. And if neither of them, you'll have to do a lateral flow test at registration, and they'll provide one for you. Um, I guess that's probably one of the biggest ones regarding COVID. Um, then social distancing throughout the course. Um, especially at reg uh, racking and registration, make sure you're sort of keeping apart. I haven't read anything about needing masks, but I think it's probably best just to go with it because you are going to be in this condensed area. So I would err on the side of caution and go with a mask um, and just stick to social distancing. But yeah, while you're racking your bike as well, I would keep the mask on. Um, just quickly going through no requirement for masks at the swim start and um, but again social distance as long as you can up to the start line and I believe that the question that were asked to us via email yeah um, so yeah yeah there's think, a there's yeah, a couple of anymore. additional points on that email thanks Dave um one was regarding the bike course, the roads are 100% open. There will be um, maybe one or two stop go boards, but it's still your responsibility to check that it's safe to go when uh, when you've been 
give, given the go, but the roads are 100% open. Um, the mountain bag that we provide will be ready for you uh, on your numbered peg at T2. Um, yeah. I think the only thing I would add is that, which was a question around the swim, which was, if the conditions are rough, could the swim get cancelled? Yes, if it does get cancelled, it will be replaced with a three kilometre run. Um, uh, whereas it, it would only probably get shortened if the water temperature would fall below. Um, and given that it's currently nearly 18 degrees, I suspect that it will it will go ahead unless it resembles the, you know, the unless it resembles Cape Horn. I think I think the swim is looking very, very good for the for the weekend. Um, that's just um, OK. A couple come in. Do we get race belts provided within the registration or race numbers? I would suspect that's a no. Nope, haven't seen anything to say that you get a race belt. Get your own, get a race belt. Um, and then there was a good one, I think, because I think I saw Arf go and get a rucksack, um, which was uh, what pe what are people using as backpacks that would fit in those little drawstring bags? I don't think I've got a backpack small enough to fit in the drawstring bag. I might just run up with, with the drawstring bag on my back. <laughs> Complete. <Yeah. laughs> well, I, I've got a, a Salomon um, 8 active skin. On, I've got this off eBay for about 30 quid. Um, yeah, and I've got a One Direction race vest thing. They, have they branched out from yeah. the records? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I got it off eBay recently. It wasn't too much. No, but you, you know, you'd get one new. I don't think they're, they're too expensive new, but... I think they are. <laughs> oh, they are, okay. <laughs> right, okay. They are too expensive new. Uh, but these fit in that drawstring bag easily. I got this in full of all the stuff with two drinks bottles and my and my running trainers in there so and that that's plenty i was quite surprised that i got it all in so um i think you had you, you were showing yours as well so to speak similar <laughs> to yeah keep it clean andy yeah um, almost at the end i know um well i would say i would say i i, I having having um raced before over to similar terrain is I can thoroughly recommend any of the Salomon running vests. You can get different ones, some that take hydration packs, some that have the soft bottles in. Um, I think they are, they can be pricey, but I think there are deals to be had. Um, whether you can get one and have practice with it before the race, but I would thoroughly recommend because the other thing as well is it doesn't move around when you run. And that 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 is the one good thing about a proper running backpack. The ergonomics of it, it, it distributes the weight a lot better across your back. So um, someone's actually saying that Decathlon do a very good cheap hydration vest, um, which is good. Um, OK, oh, here's one. Here's one for you uh, runners. How does riding off a downhill run feel? Is this, <laughs> is this something we should practice? Um, I'm say the practice bit probably a bit late, but... Um, uh, I think that's a really good question, given that that descending on on a run is very quad dominant. Quad smash. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think it feels awful. <laughs> I felt horrible. Yeah. I think this is one of those answers where we can't really <laughs> polish this one up too much, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you could possibly move yourself back a bit on the saddle, bring the hamstrings in a bit more, but uh, keep it in an easy gear, just until your legs have got a bit of uh, a bit of life back in them. Man up. <laughs> well, well, welcome to this sort of race it's all part of the experience um do you rack your bike the evening before no no good that's good easy going my favorite question so far any good pub recommendations for post race all of them there's are lo loads in other sock aren't there yeah i think there's a there's a there is a, a post-race barbecue organized in uh st tudwalls yeah, for five pounds, big pub, be nice stuff, so it's worth going to. I would, my, as well, knowing Abbasoc, is if you do want to go out after the race, it might be worth trying to book somewhere now, given the weather and the time of year. Um, I think that's it. Any other questions before? Um... I just ju jump in because my computer's about to die. Somebody has asked twice, and I think you've missed it both times, whether there's any bike mechanics on course. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that, yeah. Yeah, um, someone, someone did ask. I, I'm assuming there will be there will be a bike safety there will be bike safety cover out there should anybody break down, um, but that's more of a sweeper truck rather than providing mechanical assistance. 
Yeah, I'm not aware of any bike mechanics per se. And they do say you need to carry a mobile phone with you um, um, with the race HQ number in. I think that's for the run section and the bike, and the bike section. Um, so what me and Arthur have done, we've got like a cheap um, Tesco, like uh, pay as you go phone that you can just put in your saddle bag. Um, so you're not carrying your most valuable smartphone that's heavy with you. Um, so that might be a bit of a top tip in that <laughs> you might want to just get hold of a really cheap pay as you go phone just for that purpose. That's a great, um, that's a great one. Just, just, just make sure you tell your other half that you bought a second phone and the bike does that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Guys, so, th thanks for your time. I've really got to run. Oh, uh, dear Simon, time. thank you I, for, for taking part. I've got a caravan that needs thank packing. You. I'll see you yeah. all Saturday. Good, good luck. Good have luck. a great bye. race. Thank you. Bye. I have a couple of questions actually. For oh, phone is mandatory, not, not advised. You have to have it. Yeah, so either a cheap one or your one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, just jumping on to, to uh, Sam. Um, where, where, where were we? Where were we doing? I'm just looking for the nutrition, which was, um, I'm not sure if it's a nutrition question, but I sometimes get upset to me after swimming in salted water. Is there anything I can do to counteract that? Yeah. Um, the water. Yeah. Well, that's the obvious answer. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, it could also be related to not not nutrition, but um, like gulping air, swallowing air, rather than um, yeah, it's sort of like hyperventilating almost in the in the sea. So that's probably one thing. But you, you'd know whether that's the case or not yourself, probably from a nutrition perspective. I mean, there's a couple of things that you can try. Um, race day might not be the best time to actually try these for the first time. But coming out of the, I mean, the first thing to say is make sure you're well hydrated before you race because um, that dehydration, I mean, you, it's surprising how much you sweat when you swim, I think, especially in a wetsuit and if it's going to be decent weather. Um, I don't know what the temperatures are. It's about 20, probably 19, 20. Are we looking at for the weekend? Yeah. You know, maybe not so early in the morning, but um, again, it's surprising how much you sweat. So just make sure you're well hydrated in the morning. Um, and then when you come out of the um, sea and get onto the bike, again, there's a couple of things that you can try. Um, and they're somewhat of an old wives tale, the, the Coca-Cola idea. So using flat Coke, um, just because it's quite acidic, so it can sort of help neutralize um, your gut a little bit and, and help with that. But also it's gonna give you some um, carbs as well. So it's not a bad thing to, to go with. And the other thing that you could try and actually become, it's becoming quite popular now in sports nutrition is Kendall mint cake. Um, so it's like obviously quite minty peppermint sort of taste. Um, again, that can help sort of settle your stomach a little bit. And it is ram packed full of carbs. I think there's like 85 grams of carbs per 100 grams of Kendall mint cake. So if you want to use that for fueling um, anyway, irrespective of whether you've got dicky tummy or not, then it's not a bad option either. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sam. Um... Well, I think we are starting to get to that point where we've had loads of questions. All of the ones I think we've been asked on um, email, I think, have been covered. So I'm probably going to open it to the floor one last time before we probably try and um, bring a close to proceedings, really. So uh, one last call for any questions. I'm done, guys. I've got to scoot off. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Mark. Time, and we'll see people on, uh, on Saturday. Cheers, Mark. Cheers, guys. Thank All you right. very much. Bye. Cool. Well, I think I think on that note, um, I think we're probably going to bring it, um, unless the coaches have got anything they want to add as a last, as a last thing. Taking the scenery because yeah. it's beautiful, yeah. <laughs> especially yeah. when you're riding out from Abbasot. You can just look and you can see the mountains, and it's just just don't just take it in and enjoy the whole day. It's really good. I I absolutely second that. I think. There are there are moments that you'll remember, and I think staring at your Garmin whilst in some of the most beautiful scenery in the world is not the thing that you want to remember. 
is I would say, if you do nothing else, enjoy the race on where you are, especially given what we've had in the last 18 months. It would be, it'd be amazing to be out, I think, on this course. It's a special race for many reasons and probably for many people. Um, you know, given the distance and the challenge that it presents, I think it's a, an amazing race, you know, backed up by t- a tough a tough conditions, uh, sorry, a tough course, but backed up by the best scenery, some of the best scenery in the world. I have to say it was uh, the race I most enjoyed in 2019. And the level of support out there was amazing. Like when you're coming back down off, um, off Snowden, everyone's so friendly, even all the walkers and everyone was, you know, just cheering you on. It was, it was really good. Awesome. Um, so it's almost making me want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not quite, eh? Not quite. Not quite. Um, so the first thing, I know there were a couple of questions about, about stuff within Abasoc. I think abasoc has got a really good website. If you go to abasoc.co.uk, um, you can get loads of info around campsites, pubs, r- restaurants, places to stay, if, if, if that's possible, if you've not already booked it. Um, if not, you might need a tent. Um, guys uh, and girls, it's been a phenomenal call just over the hour. Um, on behalf of myself, Andy, the whole team, Total Try Training and the team at The Rock, we wish you the best of luck for what's due to be a sensational weekend of racing, both conditions and course. Um, of course, if there are any questions, do feel free to reach out to any of us at Total Try or any of the team at The Rock, and we will endeavour to be able to help you out. But um, have a great weekend. Stay safe, race well, look after each other, and um, we'll see you on the other side. Cheers, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Hello. Bye. Good luck, everyone. Bye.